So I have to tell you, when I finally decided to stop all of the dieting and focus on creating a lifestyle where I was no longer a slave to food, no longer tracking and counting and weighing of my food, and I was getting results, one of the very first things I did was simply learn how to get more real food in my diet. I learned how to put meals together that were fast, easy, and delicious. And when I started doing this one simple thing, my body started to change. And this is exactly why getting more real food is the very first step, step one in my five-step signature method for sane and sustainable weight loss. But I know that eating less stuff in a box or a package isn't always easy because let's face it, we're friggin' busy. But this is exactly why I created the Little Black Dress Boot Camp. This is a free seven-day program designed to show you how simple and delicious getting more real food can be. Over the seven days, I'm going to take the guesswork out of your nutrition by giving you seven days of meal inspiration so that you feel motivated, energized, less bloated, and excited to keep going with your transformation. So if you're ready to kickstart your fat loss goals, then go to ambershaw.com and grab the free seven-day Little Black Dress Boot Camp program today. All right, so I get asked a lot about my thoughts on doing detoxes and cleanses. And I have to tell you that I am not a fan of most of them because they are mostly all about deprivation and basically you starving for like three to five days. My preferred way to reset your body if you're looking to bring it back to a healthy, feel-good baseline is through a satisfying reset, which is why I want to tell you about my favorite one by Chroma Wellness. They have an incredible five-day reset program that's absolutely delicious, easy to follow, and loaded with nutrient-rich superfoods that will keep your hunger and cravings low and your energy high. This can be a perfect way to jumpstart you into a year of healthy habits, giving your body exactly what it needs. And I want to be clear, this is not a five-day cleanse where you feel deprived, hungry, and miserable. Each day of the reset leaves you feeling satisfied, energized, less bloated, clear-headed, and amazing. But most importantly, it's completely customizable to ensure you're getting the nutrients you need to support your metabolism. I actually did this one back in October, and I felt incredible. So right now, my followers are getting 15% off. Head to chromawellness.com and use code AMBER or head to the show notes and grab the code there. Welcome to the Wellness Revolution Podcast. I'm your host, Amber Shaw, a board-certified health and wellness coach, personal trainer, and mind and body transformation expert for women over 40. I empower women to stop dieting, lose the weight for good, and create a life they love. As a recovered cereal dieter and single mom of two who radically transformed her life at the age of 40, I'll be sharing tips and strategies to end the vicious cycle of dieting and find true food freedom while learning to love what you see in the mirror. Together, we will talk nutrition, fitness, mindset, relationships, personal growth, lifestyle, and basically all things life after 40. You with me, mama? Let's go. Hey friend, welcome back. Welcome back to another episode of the Wellness Revolution Podcast. I'm your host, Amber Shaw, and as always, I'm so excited to be here with you. And I'm really, really excited to share this episode with you with Dr. Jessie Haymeyer. So she is the physician founder of Well Empowered, where she practices data-driven, outcome-oriented, functional medicine. She created Well Empowered with one commitment in mind, providing you the foundation of health and vitality that transforms your experience of life and alters what's possible for you. I mean, who does not want that? And I got to tell you, she is a wealth of knowledge. And I was so fired up to talk with her because we are so aligned in our beliefs and our methodology for the way that we teach sustainable weight loss. So in this episode, we she's going to share her, her expertise in mastering uh, your middle ground, ditching the all or nothing approach when it comes to sustainable weight loss. She's going to talk about empowered and sustained weight loss, the one question that will transform what's possible. She's going to share that with you in this episode. She's also going to talk about the three most common essentials when it comes to, I'm sorry, the three most common root causes 
was getting ahead of myself here because we talked about so much. But the three most common root causes to weight loss resistance, and she's going to break those down, uh, and they are maybe not what you think they are. So you don't want to miss this episode. Uh, just it's a long one. I'm not. I'm just going to warn you guys. It's a little bit longer than I normally go because we were like in the zone, and she was giving it to me, and I was not going to stop it. So sit back, relax, and enjoy this awesome episode with Dr. H. Dr. H, welcome. I'm super excited to have you here today. Thank you so much, Amber. It's such a pleasure to be here with you and your audience. Yes. Oh my gosh. The listeners are in store for it today. I was, we were laughing about, you know, prior to hitting record that I mean, I always just get so fired up when I see, uh, you know, like a, a one sheet come across my desk. It's like all the topics that I'm so lit up about. And just with your background and expertise and obviously in functional medicine, which, you know, is, is absolutely so, so right in my wheelhouse of just passion and what I'm so passionate about talking about with my audience, we're going to have an amazing conversation and I'm here for it. Absolutely. Okay. Well, Jesse, I would love for you just to share a little bit about, you know, with the, with the listeners, you know, a little bit about your practice and really kind of how you started really getting into what you focus on a lot about weight loss and you know, sustainable weight loss and, and how, you know, lead us, lead us to how you got to what you're doing today. Absolutely. Well, the first thing I always say is straight lines are boring. Right. So uh, we'll start with that. So how I got to what I'm doing is, you know, it should have been a real cue in college. Right. I, I went to UCLA undergrad and I studied sociology because the class schedule worked really well with my workout schedule. Love so it. it was like the perfect fit. Right. I yeah, got to be outside yeah. in the California sunshine, run, rollerblade, do whatever I wanted to do. And then I went to class, of course, also. Right. Okay. Um, so after that, when I, you know, got out there in the working world, not really sure what I wanted to do, but certain that I wanted to be a contribution to people in their health journey. Mm -hmm. I first started as a physical therapy aide. When I moved back to Chicago, where I'm from, I opened up the first high intensity strength training studio in Chicago in 2002. Oh, and partnered with a husband and wife, was the managing partner there for four years, sold my half. It still is here in Chicago. And when I'm, when I'm back in Chicago, I, I'll, I go pay a visit, love it. And, and ultimately made my way to graduate school to get tooled up in order to be able to make a more meaningful difference in people's lives, right? For me, I really saw throughout my life that when I feel my best, and I look my best, I'm able to be my best. And I think it's a truth for everyone, right? And so it's been a journey of looking at, okay, what's, what's the next step that I can take to be able to contribute to others and their journeys? And so ultimately, you know, when I went to graduate school, I, I first got my degree as a chiropractor, but I never practiced as a traditional chiropractor. I've always practiced as a functional medicine physician. And, uh, and got my master's of science in nutrition and functional medicine. So that's like the academic woo woo, whatever. But, uh, but ultimately for me, it was always guided by the question, how do I make a difference for people and what tools will help me better understand how one unique body works versus another? And, yes. and, and that's how I arrived where I am. I love that. I mean, I love obviously anybody who is, you know, set, you know, building their career around in service of others. I mean, that's, that's, it's huge. It's so much of, of my why. And I love that. And so who do you, with, with the clients that you work with, do you work with a particular like demographic or do you a specialty within that? T tell us a little bit about kind of who you work best with. So I will say I work with a variety of, of conditions, you know, pro health challenges or conundrums. But the top three, the ones I see most commonly are weight loss, sustained weight loss, you know, a commitment to master sustained weight loss. In other words, mm -hmm. weight loss struggles that have lasted years or decades, mm -hmm. right? Number mm -hmm. one, for sure. Number two would be all things digestion, you know, gas, mm -hmm. bloating, constipation, diarrhea, all those things. And then number three is, I like to say, hormones gone wackadoodle. Right. Whether that's uh, related to, uh, you know, menstrual cycles that are off, heavy, long, non-existent, painful, all those things or fertility related challenges. So those are the top three. And I would say that first one, 
it makes up the majority, that commitment to master sustained and empowered weight loss. I mean, yes, you just, yeah, describe my whole coaching platform, right? Is how do we, you know, that that is the key, right? I mean, weight loss is one thing. And, and this is why I think, so this is why this topic resonates with so many women over 40. It's because they're, we're just tired of doing the diets, tired of living like this. Most of us over 40, and really what I find too, is it's, and especially for women, you know, over 50, who have really been probably doing it for doing the dieting career for like 30 years. They're just tired of it. Absolutely. They're tired of it. And, and there's this real sense, you know, I think people go through this this journey for those, you know, people who struggled in this area of their life for a long time, which I can relate to because I struggled in this area of my life for a long time. Okay. Right. Yeah. And so typically there's this period where people feel like, what is wrong with me that yes. I cannot master this. Right. I, yes. I have all, all these other areas of my life where I'm doing a great job. Maybe yes. it's, you know, as a parent or as a spouse or in their professional career, whatever, and probably a combination. And so people are scratching their heads going, what is wrong with me that I can't master this one area? But hopefully over time through working with you or with me or, you know, someone else who's like minded, they get to the point where they say, wow, there's actually really nothing wrong with me. I was handed a really crappy paradigm, right? Yes. The diet paradigm is so broken. And yes. so when people start to get Oh, it's not me, it's you, you know? Yes. It's, it's I, really transformative. It really is. And I think that's something, you know, that is a message that I really love to lean into, like on social and, you know, and really talking about this is like, girl, like it's really, like you said, like you've been handed this really shitty roadmap. Like it's not your fault. Like diets were never meant for real freaking life. And it's just, and we've been fed that lie since we were little girls. Yes, absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. So, yeah. you know, when people have that aha moment, it's so cool. And I know you fully get it and are, have a front row seat to this as well, right? To see the light bulb go on and things start to shift. And, you know, what comes out of people's mouths is just like, I just want to cry sometimes. It makes Same. me so inspired and excited to see how people's experience of themselves, their body, their lives transform. Absolutely. And, you know, and I, and I think too, I think, you know, for women so much of, and, and I don't, I don't know that people really realize this or men and women, but it's like, you know, this whole failing at the diet, you know, failing at diets, it goes so much deeper for, for so many of us, for women, right? Because over the, it may start off as, oh, we failed at this diet. And then over time, it starts to go so much deeper, like we're a failure, right? Like there's something wrong with us. Like it chips away. Every, with, I always I used to say is like with every failed diet, it was like, it just took, it just took a piece of like my confidence away. It took a piece of like my ability to believe I could really change. I mean, it's just, it's, it's way deeper. Dieting is, is way deeper than that. I agree completely. I agree completely. And you know, the very nature of, of the roadmap and paradigm we've been handed, right, is this all or nothing approach, right? You're on yes. a diet or you're off a diet, right? People do the whole 30 and then on day 31, they saddle up with a bottle of wine and, yes. you know, deep dish pizza or whatever their kryptonite du jour is, right? And it really, it, it's just so broken and it's really born mm. of self-aggression. Right. Yes. And, and so to guide people in shifting that fundamental perspective to get that they can actually journey from self love and self love is not expressed as all or nothing. It's to me, it's expressed as mastering your middle ground. And part of that is really stepping into one's confidence and taking the pen and getting that you can author your middle ground. And, and it's a journey. It's not overnight, right? It's not a 30 day endeavor, right? The whole joke about, oh, it takes 30 days to master a habit. So I should be able to master my health in 30 days. Like, no. are you kidding me? There are yeah, roughly, no. you know, 300 things, maybe probably more like a thousand things that one would need to master over time. It just takes yeah. time and practice. Well, so you mentioned something about step, and I and obviously I wholeheartedly agree. You mentioned something though about 
stepping into your confidence to start to master that middle ground. Because I agree, like I, I, you know, that, that all or nothing mentality, that is not, that, that is what keeps people from, that is what keeps people actually, that keeps the weight on. That's, I always say like diets actually cause you to gain weight, like maybe not in the short term, but it's like long-term, like it's like, because you're constantly doing this up and down, right? You're not in that middle ground. And so for somebody though, what would you say to a listener though, who, because it can be very easy to say, step into your confidence, but I can tell you, and you know, from your own practice, the number one struggle that women feel at this age, and particularly is a lack of confidence. They feel so unhappy in their body. They don't love the way they look. They just, so how, how do you even, how, what, what do you say to somebody of how to even start to step into their confidence when they don't even know what that looks like? Yeah. So where I start and just based on what, something you said when we first hopped on together today, Amber, I would, I would suspect it may be where you start also. I start by inviting people to get very clear on the what and the why of their intention for their health and their lives. Yes. Right. So, you know, there's no uh, positive affirmations or like, you know, I, I'm not uh, categorically against positive affirmations, but when they're done without depth, it's a little bit like icing on a mud pie. Right. And so to start with, you know, to really authentically journey, I guide people through an exercise I call creating your vision of vitality. Oh, yeah. And love it. Really what that entails is having people tell the story of their intended future, you know, yes. doing a little time traveling. So five years from now, I'll be 51. And, you know, in that five year future, right, sitting down and writing what it is to walk around being you, right? How's it yes. feel to get dressed in the morning? How's it feel to interact with others? Whatever comes to mind for you. There's no one right way to describe that intended future, but really speaking to what your experience is and what becomes available out of it. Because, mm -hmm. you know, you and I know the number on the scale is not that inspiring or people would have this area of their life handled, right? It's really right. not about the number on the scale. I mean, yes, we want it. Everybody wants it to be a certain number, but what people really, really deeply in their hearts want is what becomes available out of it. White rocking, walking around with a sense of confidence and connection and really being present to love, love of self, love of others and love of life. So that's really where I have people start and cultivating confidence is also a journey, right? It, 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 people have been, you know, marinating in this broken approach for so long that it doesn't just turn on a dime. But that's also the beauty of working with a skilled and seasoned guide like you, like me, like many others out there, right? You know, just like if any one of us were looking to master tennis, we wouldn't just go out on the court with a racket and a ball and hope we get really good. You know, we'd, we'd hire someone to teach us, right? And, and I think for some people, there's a sense of like, oh, well, I should, I should be able to figure this out, right? And and I understand that, but coming to terms with the truth that, you know, there are going to be lots of different people who contribute to your journey and just reaching in different directions and finding the right person for where you are right now, whether it's through listening to podcasts or reading a book or engaging one-on-one -on -one or participating in a group, so many different great ways to be guided. Yeah, I, I, of course. Absolutely. And I think, you know, I love that exercise. I actually do a very similar exercise it's from day one in my six month program is like just starting with creating the vision, right? Creating the vision, because I think for so many of us, why, you know, we hear about this, oh, create your why and, and all of that. But I think why it's even more important for women who have been kind of stuck in that dieting vortex for so long is that we actually don't even have a clear vision of who we're trying to be because who we're trying to be, who we've been trying to be is actually based on, you know, Sally, the influencer and this diet and that diet. And, and so we don't really, and this is what blocks us from creating a lifestyle that actually works for us, right? Like that, that works for them. And so the other piece of that too, I love kind of that, 
that future self exercise. And so what I find can be really powerful in that is number one, is being able then to operate from the future self, right? Like when you, when maybe you don't feel like getting up and getting that workout in, it's like, no, what would my future self do? That piece of it. And then the other part of it is, I think it's really, really important. I think people have it so wrong when it comes to embodying the feelings that you really want to feel. Like we talked about embodying that confidence feeling, right? Like that we want that, that we don't, we, that's what we truly want is we want to feel confident. And so I think for so many women, and I did for years too, you have it backwards, which is, okay, well, I will feel confident when I lose the weight. And that, that's dysfunctional for so many reasons, but one of the one of the, a, a, a big reason is because when you and I and I'm sure you will agree with this, and I love to get your take on this. But when you start to embody the way that you want to feel now, that is where your when you when your body already feels it, that is where your energy will go. That is what you know. You will start to take action to achieve that your body's already felt it your body already believes it so now you start to take action to achieve it there's something really really powerful in embodying the way you want to feel now and and uh and moving towards that direction what what are your your thoughts on i that? completely agree amber you said that so beautifully uh and you know that getting clear on your why to your point isn't just okay i get clear and i'm done you're what and your why right your vision to me, it's, it is getting clear on your vision and s practicing staying connected to it so that, you know, just like you said, what would that future self do? It just, it naturally starts to occur. People start taking actions in service of their intention. And, you yes. know, when people have that finish line approach, well, I'll, I'll just, I'll feel confident when I arrive, you know, two things, it doesn't work. And even if they do, you know, lose the weight, they're left feeling no more confident than when they started, yes. right? Because yes. there, it's like a, a contingency they placed on, you know, for themselves. Like I can only feel good if, right, sort of thing. And and that just never works. People will arrive and then they'll create the next thing. Okay, well, a hundred percent, you know, and and it's just moving the the line farther and farther and farther until you know one day. People finally get like, wow, gosh, am I just going to never feel good about myself? Like, is there always going to be a higher bar for me to jump over? Yeah. I mean, this is, and I know this is a really, because I, when I say this to women, like in my programs, I already call out what they're thinking. They're like, okay, yeah, right, Amber. Okay. Let me get to, you know, the weight that I want to be and then let me decide that. But I can, but this is where, you know, I, I can confidently say, because this happened to me, it was like every time I would like lose the weight is because... I would just, I, and then I would gain, every time I would lose the weight, I would just, like you said, keep raising the bar because con, what I realized, and this was such a hard lesson, is that even though we think confidence really does come from the external, it actually really doesn't. It really doesn't. It is such an inside job. And if you don't have that kind of unshakable confidence, um, that's totally irrelevant of, of these, you know, external things, you will always raise the bar, like you said, for sure. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. Well, one of the things that you talk about when talking, you know, we're talking about empowered and sustained weight loss is you talk about the one question that will transform what's possible. I'm dying to know. Like what, what, what? Well, honestly, we've talked about it. It is, it is getting clear on your why. On yeah. Your why. Getting clear yeah. on your why. You know, I think about, you know, where our world is in, in its health and in particular our country. And I really think if every single, every single encounter with a healthcare provider, whether it's a dermatologist or a GP or OB guy or someone like else, like us rather, if every encounter started with why do you want your health? Or maybe it might be, why do you want these outcomes? And really created the space for people to safely contemplate and share that people would start to change the relationship to the work would start to shift, yes. right? Because when people have their what and their why, the how starts to get figured out, right? People get really, yes. really creative 
and just figuring things out. And yes. I'm sure you've had this experience many, many times. You know, how many times have you worked with a woman who said, oh, I can never get rid of sugar or reduce my alcohol or whatever it is they've said. And then you just kind of nod and go, okay, you know, for now. Okay. Right. And then four to six months later on their own, they start having a conversation called, you know, I really want to reduce the amount I'm drinking or, or whatever it is, because they've, they've practiced for months, truly getting connected to their what and their why. And suddenly that thing they thought they could never do or never give up or never reduce, it becomes so accessible because they see that, you know, there's nothing more important than their what and their why. It's just a natural evolution. So, you know, I really do believe if healthcare providers started asking their clients and patients, why do you want your health or, you know, some variation of it? I really think things would start to shift for people. Yeah. Yeah. I do. Absolutely. And I think one of the, even one of the questions that's always so powerful, it's for me and, and what I ask clients too, is what's your why, but then also really leaning into like, what's it costing mm. you in your life to not make these to not make these changes. What's, and for a lot of women that comes up and uh, it's not just about their health, it's actually more relationally because a lot of women, and I'm sure you find this in your practice too, particularly in, in this, in this age demographic, they, I had, in fact, I had a conversation with somebody, a client yesterday who was saying, she just feels like she doesn't, she, she doesn't live. She's not living. Like she goes to the wedding and she's not enjoying herself because she's so self-conscious in, in the way she looks. And she's so worried about what she's eating and analyzing every single morsel of food she's putting in her mouth and worried if people are judging her and all of that. And she's not living or, you know, it, she's, and she's hiding you know, doesn't want to go hiking with her, with her family on vacation, or she's hiding in the back of pictures. And ultimately it's costing her relationships, which is that, you know, that's, that's a big motivator for a while. Definitely. Definitely. And, you know, getting clear, I think about it like two things that for all of us really cause us to get over inertia and get momentum towards change, right? Create new inertia in our favor. And those two things really are the carrot dangling and the stick on the back, right? The carrot dangling, our intended future, our what and our why. Stick on the back, oh my God, what is this costing me, right? Yes, you know, what yes. is my is my whole life going to be about me feeling crummy in my body, feeling embarrassed, feeling ashamed? Like my life is supposed to be about so much more than that, right? Yeah. So however, you know, having people get the cost of their current reality and not as a way to beat themselves up, but as a way to right. really see, oh, you know, this doesn't work. I'm done with this. Like I'm over yeah. operating the way I've been operating. And then again, it's not my fault that I've been operating this way, right? Yes. Right. Yeah. Yes. A thousand percent. Well, let's talk a little bit about um, weight loss resistance. You know, I know you obviously with your medical background, this is something that you work, I'm sure, very closely with your clients. And this is something that I also talk about with my clients because this is, you know, I, this is something I think that, again, where diet culture has really failed uh, men too, but particularly women um, with this idea, because we're so shoved down with the whole calories in calories out, eat less, move more. And really it is completely masking some really big issues, which are causing, which are really the root of why of weight loss resistance beyond doesn't matter how many calories you're eating or not eating. There's some other things that could be in play here that are affecting it. So I would love for you to share with the listeners, you know, what, what that looks like. Okay. Awesome. Well, I'm going to start by listing the three most common reasons why people, why their metabolism might have their, its foot on the brake. And then I'll go into each of them in a little more detail. So your listeners can actually take the information and run with it, put it to good use for themselves. So the top three reasons are elevated inflammation. Number two is suboptimal insulin sensitivity. 
And then number three is, it's a very technical term, uh, detoxification pathways gunked up, right? Uh, so those three, right? Elevated inflammation, suboptimal insulin sensitivity, and detox pathways gunked up. So to say a little bit more about each of these, the first one, that elevated inflammation, you know, sometimes I'll interact with people and I'm sure you have this experience too, where people will say, oh my gosh, I'm just so inflamed. And they'll say a little bit about how it shows up in their body. Maybe their skin's red or they're bloated or they have brain fog or their joints hurt or whatever, right? But for most people, there aren't really any symptoms of elevated inflammation and we can measure it and know it, right? So we always want to get the number to go with inflammation so that we know if it's a point of leverage. There are a number of different ways we can test inflammation. The one that I, I do, you know, on everyone who I work with is called HSCRP, HSCRP, which stands for high sensitivity C-reactive protein. And there are labs like, you know, there are labs like direct labs where people can just order and do it themselves. So they don't even really need to go to a, you know, a physician who can order them. They can purchase this and go get that, get that done. So HSCRP, I like to see it under two. And if it's over two, ideally under one, but under two is, is okay. Over two, uh, I'm just going to start thinking about how their uh, body has shifted into calorie conservation, aka fat storage mode, right? When inflammation is elevated, that's what happens. And it becomes this vicious circle that we really need to be targeted in, addra in addressing. And so then we circle, we do our work and we circle back and we also measure it again, even though we can see the effect over time, right? On the scale, it will start to show up. So that's number one, that elevated inflammation. Number two, related to suboptimal insulin sensitivity, uh, you know, the range for quote unquote normal fasting insulin is pretty darn high. It's on some labs, it'll be 18, others, it'll be 20. I like to see that number under eight. And if it's over eight, it's telling me that there's more insulin in the body, at least partially given by a little bit of a decrease in insulin sensitivity, meaning the cells aren't hearing the message as well as we want them to. At least that's part of the equation. And when insulin is chronically elevated, again, our body is in energy conservation, fat storage mode. So number two, in fasting insulin under eight. Number three, that de those detox pathways gunked up, right? The word detox is so chic, right? We hear so much. And you just slap detox on a supplement and it just makes everyone in the world want to buy it, including myself, right? It's just, yeah. oh, wow, must yeah, be yeah, good, right? Yeah, yeah, um, yeah. But there are real ways we can understand our detoxification pathways working well. And when they're not, the body's going to accumulate toxins. The body's going to uh, have altered hormones, which are, you know, sex hormones, because sex hormones and toxins, among other things, mm -hmm. go through those detox pathways. So that there are a number of different ways I, I try to understand is there something to that for the person in front of me. One of them is just in conversation, right? If they're chronically constipated, their detox pathways are being really stressed, right? Because we're not just what we eat, we're what we don't excrete. So when we're not pooping daily, we reabsorb those toxins and they, you know, float around and affect our cells. Of course, there's, okay, how much alcohol is someone having and assessing nutrients that really help those detox pathways run well. There are lots of fancy ways we can check that out. But suffice it to say, those are the top three physiological reasons that I see for why people are struggling to lose weight. I know people always want it to be their thyroid and it just often is not, right? I would say about 85 to 90% of the time, it's not the thyroid. Uh, it doesn't mean don't have your thyroid assessed. Absolutely, absolutely, absolutely. We never know until we check it, but it's just mostly not the thyroid. So I want to share with you what I've been incorporating more of into my life these days, and that's matcha. This powerful superfood helps with anti-aging, hormone balance, improves focus and concentration, it enhances metabolism, reduces stress and anxiety, and it improves immune function. But the truth is, is not all matchas are the same, which is why I'm obsessed with Symbiotica's matcha. 
What makes it unique is that it is 100% organic and it's organic ceremonial grade matcha. It's also made with high quality ingredients in small family farms in Uji and Kagoshima, Japan. Plus, it's got such a rich and creamy and smooth taste that I love. So right now, my followers are getting 15% off with code AMBER15. So head to symbiotica.com and use AMBER15. That's C-Y-M-B-I-O-T-I-K-A.com and use AMBER15. I mean, the, I love these. These are such powerful things that uh, th- these are such powerful tips and obviously big, big root causes that are just aren't talked about unless you are maybe, fu- you know, unless you are in that circle of kind of the integrative med- medicine, functional medicine, all of that, because this is not what diet culture talks about. We don't, they, we don't talk about this, but it is very, very real. And this is exactly why, you know, when I, when I coach, you know, everybody wants some like really sexy, restrictive meal plan when it comes to losing weight. And I am, I'm like, no, let's just focus on eating for more of stable blood sugar control. Let's, let's focus on, uh, you know, on, on really trying to, to balance back out your, your insulin, improve that insulin sensitivity, and you will start to see drastic changes in your body. You don't have to cut out whole foods. You don't have to, you don't have to do all of that. Um, it's, it's more about really paying attention to, to the, to the hormones and, and what that looks like. And so I love that you're highlighting these. Tell us, tell the listeners, so I want to break each of these down because these are really big and I don't want them to miss this. When we talk about reducing inflammation, what are some of the ways that you guide your patients um, in and starting to, to reduce and maybe some of the things that the listeners now can start? Yeah. So with regards to inflammation, when it's above two, we're going to do a few things. We are going to make nutritional shifts and we're definitely using supplements. We've got to break that vicious circle. So from the nutritional shifts, you and I are soul sisters, right? We are, we are totally speaking the same language, starting with real foundational balancing out blood sugar, protein, fat, nutrient dense, high fiber carbs, you know, those whole yes. foods kind of things. And in, in looking at, I think of two things, what will help and what will hurt? right? What will help and what will hurt. So what will help is we know cruciferous vegetables have a meaningful and measurable impact on inflammation. Uh, Cruciferous vegetables are things like broccoli, kale, cauliflower, you know, Brussels sprouts. Those are examples of cruciferous vegetables. So that's, that's one vote, right? And, you know, there are some people who struggle from a digestive standpoint, no matter what they do, they get bloated from those things. So there are different things that we do if, if that's true for them. And then we have all these amazing, like super easy anti-inflammatory add-ons, things like ginger, things like, you know, cinnamon, things like green tea, right? Really, you could make a cup of green tea and splash some cinnamon in it. That's great. Fabulous, right? So yeah. all these different points of leverage that will be useful. And then, okay, what hurts, quote unquote, in other words, what causes, what adds to inflammation more than optimal alcohol, which in a medical sense, you know, in a perfect world, so to speak, we'd be targeting four drinks a week for women. But I really don't get dogmatic about that because I want to work with the person in front of me because any shift is a good shift, right? And for many people, it just starts with getting clear on how much they are drinking, right? I know for me, there was a point in my life where if someone said, how many drinks are you having a week, you know, in my twenties and early thirties, I would have given a wildly wrong answer. Not because I was trying to lie, just because I was fooling myself unintentionally. (laughs) Oh, I was trying to lie. Are you kidding me? No, I, no, okay, I, maybe I was trying to lie a little. No, are you? I was lying. Are you kidding me? Because then when I, because when I really started adding them up, I was like, oh shit, I'm drinking a lot. Right. Yeah, no, I, totally. I was lying. Totally right. I love it. I love it. I love it. So you know, that's just to say, like, ladies, please, not an ounce of embarrassment in that realm. Yeah. Amber and I have been yeah. there, right? And it yeah. just starts with, okay, really, truthfully, how many drinks am I having a week? And then yeah. what's a better game, right? Am I just gonna, okay, some people it's, okay, I, it's easier for me to be a no two nights than decrease how much I'm drinking on a given night. And for other people, that's not true. Other people, it's, okay, it's easier for me to create a maximum drinks in one sitting, right? Two, three yeah. drinks in one sitting, whatever people say, right? But it's just the game of progress over perfection there. So, so that's, you know, okay, we know that that will be helpful. 
foods that create inflammation, um, you know, too much red meat. I'm, I am, I am an omnivore. So I am, you know, I, yeah. Right. I, how many people ask you if you're a vegetarian? I'm like, Oh my God, no, no, right? oh my God, no, God, no, no, right? no. I love totally, me. Totally. So, you know, more than twice a week with that red meat, it does start to contribute yeah. to inflammation is what I see. Yeah. Fried foods, inflammation, right? So it, it and then, you know, what, to step back over to what helps reduce inflammation, omega-3 rich foods, right? So our high omega-3, low mercury fish, things like salmon and Arctic char and trout and um, seafood like shrimp, those are helpful anti-inflammatory omega-3 fatty acids. And then on the supplement front, honestly, one of my favorites if uh, I do measure people's omega-3 fatty acids, so if they're super duper low, I will turn to an omega-3 supplement. If they don't need it, I don't go there. Or if they're in a reasonable place but need a little bump and are up for really tackling nutrition from an omega-3 perspective, we'll go there. That's fine. Yeah. But but if they're either like, hell no, I don't eat fish, or they're just really, really low on those omega-3s, we will turn to a great omega-3 supplement, typically in the range of 1,200 milligrams to 2,000 a day, just depending on what someone needs. Yeah. And then another supplement for sure, a very well-absorbed curcumin. And yeah. my favorite form of well-absorbed cur curcumin is, is something called Meriva, M-E-R-I-V-A, and Mariva is a, a patented form of, of curcumin that is found in a lot of different supplements. So it's not just, oh, you can only find this in one brand. You just want to make sure it's this Mariva form because over and over again, it is the most well-absorbed form of curcumin and curcumin's not always well-absorbed. So you don't want to be paying for a supplement that's not doing anything, right? So you want to get that Mariva form. And well, and also, and so people, people that aren't familiar with curcumin, I mean, that, so that's what's, that's like the active ingredient in turmeric. Yes, so thank people you. are wondering like why, you know, why, why you take turmeric, that is because of the, the, the really what you're wanting is curcumin. Yes. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you for yeah. saying that. I, yeah, yeah. Awesome. Yes, totally. And so, you know, depending on how high someone's inflammation is, I'll do one gram three times a day and we'll do that for a couple of months and then we'll retest. So those are, you know, that all of that done together is, in my experience, is really going to move the needle on inflammation. And it's so fun. It's so fun to see it start to change in numbers. But before that, you're going to start to see it change in experience, right? People will say, I have so much more energy, right? Because when inflammation is elevated, it doesn't just cause your body to store fat. It also it's like, uh, you know, it interferes with our ability to produce energy. It interferes with our ability to think clearly. It'll show up differently for different people. But the point being is, well, before we go back and see what the number says, that HSCRP, people will start to notice it, right? Their joints don't hurt. I had a woman who I worked with, oh my gosh, Amber, when we first started working together, she was taking, I kid you not, 9 to 12 Advil a day for joint pain. <sighs> I mean, I was like, oh my gosh, you were, ha you were like tomorrow, you're going to bleed out from all of this Advil, right? Yes. And your gut yes. and your gut health is terrible totally, and all of that. Totally. Oh my gosh. And she, yeah. it wasn't like, she didn't, she wasn't taking them to be cute. She was taking them because she was yeah. in so much pain, in pain. right? Yeah. And oh within gosh. about one month, she got to a place where she needed zero, zero Advil. Oh she went God. to nine, nine to 11 Advil a day to none. I mean, when I saw that, I wanted to cry. I was so excited, you know? Yeah, absolutely. Of course. And you know what? One of the things I love what you said, and I just want to make sure they they heard that is notice that you, guys, you didn't say the foods that are good and foods that are bad. You said foods that help and foods that hurt. And also think about the, what you were, and one of the other ones that, that I know you'll grow too, is that, you know, sugar is obviously a big one that causes inflammation. Yes. So think about what Dr. H just said. She was listing the foods. Like if you're, ju if you just make it about reducing inflammation, forget trying to lose weight, right? Just forget, forget that off the table. Cause for so many of us, that has such a, even though we don't realize like a mental, like uh, the, 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 such a mental piece of it, of that goal, because we've like tried and failed diet so many times. Let's set a new goal that has no negative strings attached to it, right? No baggage attached to it. Let's set the goal of reducing inflammation and think about the food she just said to eat. 
getting more cruciferous vegetables, getting more healthy fats into your diet, reducing alcohol, reducing sugar. What do you think is going to be the byproduct if you start eating that way? You will have better energy. You will have less pain, but you will most likely start to lose weight. Do you, do you also, do you also see absolutely, in your practice? Absolutely. And thank you yeah. for calling out sugar. Absolutely. Sugar and simple carbs, yeah. right? Those, you know, white potatoes, pretzels, bread, white pasta, all those things. Absolutely. Those things are, are hell on inflammation, right? That yeah. really fuel that fire. Uh, but yes, definitely. And to your point, I really invite people, when people come to me and they say, oh, my goal is to lose 20 pounds or whatever they have to say, 50 pounds, 60 pounds, doesn't matter, right? My goal is X, Y, Z as it pertains to the scale. One of the things that we start to work on is shifting that to have their commitment to be, not goal, but commitment to be, to cultivate these new habits, right? And that's done over time, yes. cultivating new habits. And then, like you said, the side effect is they lose weight. But Losing yes. weight is not a goal. It's a side effect, right? right? The real oh, commitment I love that. is yes. cultivating these habits. Yes. Oh, I love that. Oh my God. That's such a good social post. I'm going to steal it. It's like the key to sustainable weight loss. Yes. Is, is Yes. I love that. Love that. Love that. But it's true. You know, if you want sustainable weight loss, then weight loss isn't the goal. It's the byproduct. Yes. Absolutely. Yeah, I mean, absolutely. Oh, I love that. Okay. So let's talk about then step number two. So we're talking about really improving your, what are some ways? I know some ways that I go about it with my clients to improve that insulin sensitivity, but what are, and this is something I think that this is why this is so important too. This is really something that flies so under the radar. People think that they are only insulin, re, like I have, you know, issues with their insulin sensitivity or some insulin resistance if they are a diabetic. And that's, that's not necessarily true. Your body might not be functioning in its optimal way, which could be, um, you might not be to that extreme yet, but it might not be that you're, that it might be that things are not working the way that they should. And it absolutely is affecting your ability to lose weight. So I would love for you, like, how do you work with your clients to start to improve that, that insulin sensitivity? Yeah. Well, it, I'm sure I know, you know, it comes as no surprise that it's not all that different than reducing inflammation, right? There are a few little tweaks there. But definitely, number one, what, you know, what hurts, we'll start with the what hurts on this one, and that's sugar, simple carbs, for sure, right? And so when working with people, we'll talk about, okay, what are some new solutions, right? Rather than just saying, okay, no this or no that or less this or that, less that, let's come up with some swap opportunities, right? Let's come up with some things that you enjoy that also support your body in a meaningful way, right? What could we use instead of bread? What could we use instead of a regular pasta? I'm a huge fan of bean pasta, right? Even those complex carbs will affect insulin a little bit more than, you know, more than the fats and the protein. So we still want to be mindful of total quantity, right? And complex carbs being higher fiber, I think of at least three grams or more. But still, we're going to do so much better with a bean-based pasta than a regular pasta or a black rice over a white rice, right? So looking at those little shifts that will support insulin sensitivity and also being mindful of quantity, right? It, it kind of like, you know, maybe a quarter cup of some of these more starchy carbs, right? And, yeah, and starting yeah. out the day, really laying the foundation for insulin sensitivity with if people are are eating breakfast and and I personally in my experience find that most people do best when they eat breakfast right I'm not categorically against intermittent fasting I totally get that it works well for people uh some people but my big my big kind of beef with it is or or biggest concern is is this something you can sustain and if it mm -hmm. feels like self aggression I would mm, suspect, 100%. yeah, you can't sustain it. And for a lot of people who have struggled with their weight, it just does. It just does feel like self-aggression. Well, and I think I think what it is, and this is so much of what, what, how I, because I am a fan of intermittent fasting. However, I am against it when you treat it like a yeah. diet. When you when you are when the clock is trumping the way that you are yeah. feeling and you are white knuckling it and you are ignoring your body's biofeedback that you need food that you then that is a diet and that is not right. So I think that intermittent fasting can be a very 
good tool. Um, if it, like you said, if it feels good in your body, if, if, if you're not ignoring, and for me, there's days where um, I, I always listen to my body just earlier. I mean, I typically don't eat till around lunchtime, but we're getting ready to do this podcast. And I was like, huh, I've been up since five. I'm actually, I'm really hungry right now. I, I, I'm going to go eat. And I don't even think about it because intermittent fasting, I think they, people think about it. Like if they, that, uh, that they're going to mess it up and you, you can't really mess it up. So it's like, you have to always listen to your body. So I wholeheartedly agree with you. I think that when people treat it like a diet, that's. The yeah, problem. definitely. Definitely. And yeah. I, I love that you just shared how, how in tune you are with your body. And, and it's really like, there's so much self-honor in that, right? That you, you're not yeah. dogmatic in your approach. You know, what typically works for you. And on a given day, if something else serves you, you do that thing. That's great. Really great. Yes. And yeah. so, yeah. so yeah. So if people are having breakfast and even if they're not making sure their first meal is really fat, protein, you know, yes. non-starchy vegetable centric, right? And if they're having breakfast, we might even skip vegetables, right? It might be a couple of eggs and some avocado or a smoothie that has you know, maybe they have a little bit of a quarter cup of, of berries or a low glycemic, you know, low sugar fruit sort of thing, if they're going to incorporate that. Or maybe we go more towards fat and, and use more of like an avocado based smoothie instead. But the point being really starting out your day with that foundation of blood sugar stability will have spiral up benefits in so many ways, right? It will help people be more sane, right? They won't have the cravings they have if they're having, you know, a, a decent load of carbohydrates and every body is a little bit different. I know my body is really sensitive, right? If I have a little bit of even something like black rice or beans or something like that at breakfast, I'm going to get hungry faster. I'm not categorically mm -hmm. against doing that. I just know that that's going to be what's going to happen, right? They're high quality yeah. options. They're yeah. not, you know, they're, they're not things that I'm going to totally avoid, but for the most part, I am going to focus on protein, fat centric first meal of the day. And, and so th those are a few things that are going to support insulin sensitivity from a nutritional perspective, from a supplement perspective, berberine is a great, yeah, yeah you, you totally got it right. Yeah. Berberine is, is a huge winner on that one. And, and for berberine, you know, 500 milligrams, three times a day. And, and I'll just jump in here with, you know, the, uh, just to say that for anyone who's considering supplements, you definitely want to work with someone to make sure they're not interfering with any medications you might be on, sure. or they might be making sure they're appropriate for you and your body. But, you know, 500 milligrams of berberine three times a day really does help insulin sensitivity. And then the same thing about omega-3s, right? Whether you're getting them from your diet, from omega-3 rich fish or seafood, that's my first vote. Omega-3 rich plant-based foods like, um, you know, chia or flax seeds or, you know, hemp seeds, walnuts, those are lovely. They're just not going to be the quote unquote active forms of omega-3. So love it when people do it, but we still want to be mindful of making sure that, you know, omega-3s are really, from a nutritional perspective, we're focusing on, um, you know, seafood and fish. Yeah, for sure. And what a lot of people don't know too is berberine also, I, obviously, as you know, can also help with candida yes. in the gut, the yeast in the gut. So it's also going to help you. It's a great supplement uh, for, for helping them with insulin sensitivity, but then also helping your gut health, um, which for, you know, that's always been one. I've always taken it in a tincture format. I'm going to tell you, it tastes disgusting. And then the tincture format, it tastes like a, like it's not, it's not good. If you take it in a tincture format, it's not good. Um, but uh, the other thing too, in case the listeners are wondering, going back to the nutritional part about the, the insulin sensitivity, um, you know, I, the, the reason why, you know, we want to stick, as you know, obviously, you know, is that the protein and the, the good fats, that's what's going to just keep our insulin more stable, Absolutely. right? Those carbohydrates are what's going to, so if listeners are wondering like, why, why can't I have the carbohydrate? And I noticed too, or they can't have this, yes. you know what I'm saying? It's like, why is it? Yeah. And I noticed that. I love it. You said about it really sets up your day foundationally, because when you do have those, you know, the, if the, you know, those spikes, as you know, those crashes, that is what's going to lead to, like you said, the more cravings and energy uh, issues and all of that. And so I find with my clients that when they do start, like you said, with a more fat and protein centric diet, that just sets them up for success for the, the rest of the day and they make better choices. Totally. It's like, you know, spiral up benefits. It's one point of leverage 
that has a, a positive impact throughout the day, you know, and how they feel and the choices they're able to make because they feel sane, right? They're not like feeling owned by cravings that are a natural byproduct of blood sugar roller coaster, right? So yeah, yeah. definitely, yeah. definitely. Okay, so let's just talk, quickly talk about this last one. I know you already mentioned, you know, you talked about the detoxification pathways and you mentioned, you know, obviously about, you know, pooping once a day. Um, what are some other ways? And I'd also love to know your thoughts on uh, women over 40 taking a glutathione uh, supplement. Yeah, so with regards to detoxification pathways, so what helps, funny enough, those cruciferous vegetables also fuel, uh, provide the key components needed for the detox pathways to work well. Our B vitamins are really important for those detox pathways. So um, at the very least, having your B12 and folate assessed to make sure they're in optimal ranges. And, you know, optimal for B12, for most people, I like to see that at 800 or higher. And for folate, 20 or higher. So B12, 800 or higher, folate, 20 or higher. And some people will have to supplement with those. Um, for a variety of reasons. Sometimes there are genetic, there's a really common genetic mutation of a, a gene called MTHFR that just simply put the people with that mutation, they just need more, more B12 and folate than the average person. No problem. We just want to make sure you're getting a high quality option, something that has a methylated B12 and folate versus folic acid. There are lots of great options out there. So that's, you know, one way to support your detox pathways. Obviously, water, staying hydrated is a way to support your detox pathways. Fiber, which will help you poop along with the water, is a good way to support your detox pathways. Protein. So protein is essential for well-running detox pathways. We need our amino acids to run the enzymes that are the essence of these detox pathways. And so I, you know, that is definitely something I encounter when I work with vegans or vet vegetarians who are really, really committed to, for whatever reason, maybe it's religious or philosophical or, or, you know, whatever the case may be to remaining vegan or vegetarian, we really have to get creative about how we're filling their protein needs so that their detox pathways run well. So those are some ways that we can help it. Uh, definitely you know, there's this interplay between inflammation and detoxification. So oftentimes they're coexisting. So something like from a supplement standpoint, curcumin, certainly very helpful. Yes. I love, yes. That's so, so helpful. Cause I think we don't, we don't think about that. We don't, we don't think about, um, a lot of those different, uh, different things as it relates to weight loss. Yeah. That's just not something that, well, because of course, that's not something we, we, that's information that's usually readily available to us. So I am curious though, just even talking about not necessarily detoxification pathway, but just even, because this is a supplement that's been coming up uh, a lot because I am a low in glutathione. Yes. So just talking about general detoxification in the body, what are your, what are your thoughts on glutathione? Yeah, so great question. So glutathione, as your listeners may know, it's your body's most potent antioxidant. It is, you know, just really a star studded antioxidant in our body. And antioxidants are important to support, you know, to clean up the damage associated with just day to day life, right? What we encounter from um, the toxins we encounter, uh, natural low grade inflammation that is present in all of us, you know, to some extent from producing energy, we produce some some free radicals. So antioxidants, fundamentally speaking, we know we love, right? And glutathione is, is the number one antioxidant. So I love that you had your glutathione levels tested mm -hmm. before you started supplementing. Mm -hmm. So that's first and foremost how I would recommend people proceed to not supplement with glutathione unless there's a need for it. I do love when I can support somebody with NAC, N-acetylcysteine, mm -hmm. because N-acetylcysteine helps your body produce glutathione. So as opposed to giving it glutathione, it helps your body produce glutathione. Now, it doesn't always work for people, right? There are genetic mutations, just like we talked about with the B vitamins, yeah. that really mean that, okay, this person needs whole form, well-absorbed, liposomal glutathione, right? And, and then totally great, fine. 
but I do love that NAC, not just because it helps your body produce it, but also because it does so many other great things. Yeah. It helps disrupt biofilms, which are basically like the invisibility cloak of certain microbes that, that keep them hidden in the body and causing problems. So love NAC for that. It also naturally enhances your immune response, your, your white blood cells and their ability to seek and destroy, so to speak, invaders. So those are a few reasons why I just love NAC and, and turn to it in lieu of glutathione when I can. And I can't always, right? Sometimes for sure, glutathione is the right choice. Yeah, it's so interesting. You know, I, and this all makes sense to me because like why I definitely have some sort of genetic mutation when it comes yes. to that, because I've had melanoma three times. Oh my goodness. Yeah. Wow. Like full blown, like melanoma. <sighs> so both of them, one was, two of them were stage two. One uh -huh. was a stage one, um, uh -huh. but it makes sense to me because even when I take NAC and I was having to have uh, glutathione IVs, like four grams, six, four to six grams, like every three weeks, because the NAC wasn't doing anything for me. Yeah. And so now it's like, it makes sense. I do, I'm like, obviously I've got some sort of genetic mutation. It's like my body is not doing the natural detoxification and that's not working right because I am, and my father died of, uh, you know, of uh, very, very aggressive thyroid cancer. And so, yeah, I mean, it is. So I am like, I get my glutathione tested regularly. I take the NAC, I take the glutathione, all of it. Yeah. That's awesome. I mean, good for you for being proactive and really seeking out a, a, an amazing point of leverage to support your health and longevity. That's great. Yeah. Oh my God. Listen, I swear to you, I could talk, keep talking to you for like two hours because we didn't even get through half of what I wanted to talk with you about because you are just I, a wealth of knowledge. This is going to be such a jam packed episode for so many of my listeners. I'm so grateful for you and, and for being here today. Oh my God. The feeling is purely mutual. Mutual. It's been such a pleasure to be with you. And yeah, give us a 10 hour episode. Yes. I, I think we could easily fill it and have more to say. Yes, girl. Well, listen, I know that they are going to be, the listeners are going to be wanting to get more of you. Where, where's the best place to reach out to find you? So on my website, wellempowered.com, you can check that out, schedule a complimentary consultation if you'd like to. And on social media, Instagram at Well Empowered. And for anyone who's interested in connecting and exploring working together, tell, make sure you mention where you heard about Well Empowered and you will get 10% off. I love that. You guys, you need to go right after you hit stop on this episode. Go follow Dr. H on social, connect with her. Uh, you obviously, after listening to just how amazing she is, you will not regret it. So thank you again for being here. Thank you so much, Amber. You are welcome, my mama. Thank you so much for listening today. I'm always so honored to be in your ear and I will catch you on the next one.